Hello and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays from the Deep Carbon Observatory. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of GCO's engagement team based at the University of Rhode Island. This webinar is brought to you by Engagement and DCO's Synthesis Group 2019. Today's webinar is the final one in a series focused on synthesizing science, in which we're highlighting some of DCO Synthesis projects. The goal of DCO Synthesis efforts is to bring together 10 years of deep carbon science and share what our scientific community has learned and what remains unknown and perhaps unknowable about the quantities, movements, forms and origins of carbon in Earth. It is my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenters. Dr. Dmitry Svajensky is a professor in the, Earth de in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Johns Hopkins University, where he has taught since 1984. A geochemist, his research interests are diverse and include deep Earth carbon, nitrogen, sulfur and water cycles, astrobiology, high temperature and pressure aqueous solution chemistry, and chemical equilibria and mass transfer. He is a fellow of the Geochemical Society and the European Association of Geochemistry, and a recipient of the Lindgren Award from the Society of Economic Geologists. Dr. Mark Giorso is the Vice President and Senior Research Associate at OFM Research Inc. Mark also serves as an affiliate professor at the University of Washington, an adjoint professor at Vanderbilt University. Mark is a fellow, counselor and distinguished lecturer of the Mineralogical Society of America and his work has been recognized with honors from the Mineralogical Society of America, the European Geosciences Union and the American Geophysical Union. Dimitri and Mark um, together co-PI the synthesis project Melts and Dew, which is what we'll hear about today. The Melts and Dew team is working to integrate existing thermodynamic models of magmas and fluids to form a framework allowing researchers to model the mass transfer and transport of carbon and other chemical elements within Earth. This work is allowing the team to start asking questions like how do fluids and magmas work together to transport carbon in deep Earth and how much carbon can Earth's mantle accommodate? Before I hand over the mic to Dimitri, a few bits of housekeeping. The presentation portion of the webinar will last about 10 minutes and then we'll go into an interview portion. If you have any questions you'd like to ask our panel, please type them into the chat and we'll address them in the interview section. The chat is also where we'll post any relevant links. So with that, I'm pleased to sign off and turn it over to Dimitri. Thank you very much, Katie. It's a great pleasure to be able to do this webinar with you and with Mark. And I really appreciate the help from the engaged team. So today I want to summarize progress on the dew melts project and my first slide shows the title super solvus fluids from fluid water to liquid rock the motivation for trying to understand fluids and magmas together is shown by the little wiggly arrows in this classic cartoon from craig manning 2014 these little wiggly arrows have long been a mysterious but very important concept in the whole earth plate tectonic theory, representing some kinds of fluids or melts coming off the slab as it descends into the mantle. These fluids and or melts provide a key link to uh, partial melting in the mantle here and to the return of carbon and many other chemical elements uh, through degassing in volcanoes. So the real question we're trying to address is what are these little wiggly arrows representing? Fluids, melts, or perhaps even a new type of fluid phase that is technically neither a melt nor a fluid. And this is what I call a super solvus, supercritical fluid. So the two types of situations we've really been addressing in the dew melts project. The first one is shown here how do melts and fluids actually communicate with each other when they're immiscible liquids adjacent to each other? So this comes down to the modeling of equilibria between melts and fluids. And Mark Giosso has made uh, a lot of progress on this goal. Going to much higher pressure conditions, we often have the situation where melts and fluids can in fact mix completely forming what we might call a, a magma fluid continuum that runs in its properties all the way from pure water 
to pure liquid rock. This is a special type of fluid that we can call a supercritical fluid, but in particular, a supersolvers fluid, as shown in the next slide. On the left is the situation I referred to first, where fluid and milk coexist. And the special curve shown here called the solvus is that part of composition between water and rock, water here on the left and rock on the right versus temperature on the y-axis that specifies the chemistry of a coexisting fluid and a coexisting melt with increasing temperature, their compositions converge to this point above which for a limited range of bulk chemistry at these relatively low pressures and high temperatures, a supercritical fluid could exist. In contrast, over on the right-hand side, we have, we have what a very different circumstance. Here we have complete compositional variability possible between pure water and pure melt on the far right-hand side. On the left, we have an H2H, H2O rich fluid, and on the right, we have a silica rich fluid. And it's the black curve is what we call a continuous solubility curve going, running from water rich to silicate liquid rich. This is a very special type of supercritical fluid because there's no solvus left. The fluids are not immiscible. There is only one fluid and I'm proposing it be called a super solvus supercritical fluid. The exact pressure at which this occurs differs for different types of rocks. In the next slide, I'm focusing in on this super solvus supercritical fluid, emphasizing the quantities of water approximately on the x axis from 100% water here, 75, 50, 25% water here, 0% water here. So this would be dry rock melting in the extreme circumstance to this supercritical fluid. The question for, that I really want to address today that I've been working on most recently is that. We know that the deep earth water model and related solubility speciation mass transfer codes can operate well under very water rich conditions. Let's say down in this region. And in fact, we've been able to, through very intensive work in the last five years, calibrate the properties of the deep earth water model and the aqueous species uh, over this region uh, as going to higher and higher concentrations. The question is how far can we go along this curve using a water-based model? And that's what I want to address today. So recent advances in modeling deep earth fluids, um, this is really a paper in review at Geochemica Cosmochemica Acta, uh, involved the following uh, new features. First of all, we've calibrated a bunch of metal complexes, metal formate, metal silicate, metal hydroxide complexes with experimental solubility data for peridotite water, eclogite water systems from Kessel et al, co-workers at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The summary deep earth water model Excel sheet is available already on the, on the community website, but the solubility speciation codes will only be available once we have the paper uh, referred to above here uh, actually in press. The model additionally has activity coefficient models for the ions and neutral species, including provision for very high CO2 content and an activity model for water so that we're not restricted to extremely water rich compositions. In addition, this allows us to make explicit provision for hydration of aqueous complexes such as SiOH4, the silica monomer, and MgOH2, a magnesium hydroxide complex. Two additional key advances involving uh, silica and carbon, I want to refer to specifically. On the left, we can see that experimental data for the solubility of silicon in moles per kilogram of water um, in a subsolidus fluid in equilibrium with potassium free eclogite. The experimental data points are from Kessel et al. 2005 uh, in blue. Um, the red curve represents my calculations using a silica monomer and dimer from my 2014 paper. Clearly, additional species are needed, 
and a long suspected species based on uh, a number of workers' uh, experimental data and theoretical estimates is a silica trimer. In addition, we have all the metal silicate complexes I referred to earlier. So in short, we have used the experimental data to calibrate the model uh, between 700 and 1,000 degrees and at 4 and 5 GPA. Notice that the silica contents of the fluid at 800 degrees, 900 and 1,000 go from 8% by weight, SiO2 component, to 36.8%. And the water content goes from extremely water rich, 87.8%, down to 53%. That's still a, quite a water-rich fluid. Using the values of the equilibrium constants for the silica trimer, shown here as a fully hydrated species in equilibrium with three silica monomers, we have re retrieved the equilibrium constant of this reaction at a range of conditions from Kessel's experiments, shown in orange and black, and also from Craig Manning and Hunt and Manning's work in 1994 and 2012 in the green and blue dots. So we can now use that for higher pressure temperature predictions. The second important advance that I wanted to mention specifically is that of carbonic acid, H2CO3. This is the molecule I like to say that geochemists, including myself, uh, have forgotten for many, many decades. However, I think to a remarkable paper on theoretical ab initio calculations by Pan and Gali, 2016, we now have some semi-quantitative estimates of the equilibrium constant for this reaction at two kilobars and at 100 kilobars. Going back into the old literature, this is why this is something that's been forgotten, we see that there are experimental data from a study by Whisper and Adel, 1954, at very low temperatures on the dissociation of what they called the true carbonic acid molecule to bicarbonated H+. I recalculated that here for this reaction. The important thing is that the curves represent a deep earth water model preliminary fit to the data. There is sufficient data to make such a fit because of the predictive nature of the model. And you can see that as expected, the hydration of CO2 to H2CO3 is very strongly favored with increasing pressure. That is to say, the equilibrium constants increase dramatically with pressure because it's a hydration reaction. So at high pressures, there is no CO2 molecule to be expected in any kind of aqueous fluid, no matter how complex the chemistry, depending on the activity of water. However, the molecule that should be expected is H2CO3, whose concentration will depend on the activity of water. So using these new calibrations, as shown here, this is the same graph I showed you earlier at 5 GPA, we've been able to make predictions into the supersolvus region using experimental data as yet unpublished but in press by El Azar et al. from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem with Ronit Kessel's group in Geochemica, Cosmochemica, Acta. At 6 GPA, their data shows that we're in a true supersolvus supercritical fluid. It's a continuous solubility curve from low to very high temperatures. And what's remarkable here is that we can predict this red curve through the data points, where the, the concentration of silica goes from about 19 to 25 weight percent, and the concentration of water goes from about 40 down to about 25 weight percent. So in particular, we'll focus on this fluid at 1100 degrees C and 6 GPA, as our model supersolvus fluid. It also has in it about 25 weight percent CO2 as a component, CO2, and about 25 weight percent of metal oxide components, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, and iron. So it's about 25, 25, 25, and 25. So this answers our primary question here that I wanted to address. The red star shows at 1100 degrees C and 25 weight percent water that we can model with the deep earth water model and aqueous speciation solubility codes all the way from pure water up to 1100 degrees C at about 25 weight percent water. 
So this is really a fluid that is rich in silica and in all the rock forming silicate components. And in a sense, it's really a magma like fluid. And yet we're able to model this with a water based model, at least to this point. It's also very interesting to speculate on what might happen to a fluid like this in the deep earth if it, if it decreased in pressure through rising in the earth, would it unmix back down to a water-rich immiscible fluid and a silicate melt? And there've been papers suggesting this type of behavior. Continuing on with this same experimental data for a potassium-bearing eclogite from Elazar et al., I plotted the predicted solubility of carbon in this supersolvous fluid which goes up to about 35 molal here, which happens to be about 25 weight percent CO2 component. But the major species in the fluid are actually metal formate complexes, and also H2CO3, six molal out of 35, bicarbonate, five molal out of 35, and CO2 is only about 0.4 molal out of 35 molal. So this is a very interesting fluid. And I'd like to briefly consider to finish up the geologic implications of a fluid like this in the upper mantle. I think the most important implication is for the, for the inferred redox state of the mantle during water rock interactions. If we have a fluid containing H2CO3, carbon in oxidation state four, plus four, and formate an aqueous organic anion with carbon in oxidation state plus two, in equilibrium with a eclogetic rock, for example, where the pH is fixed by the rest of the silicate minerals, garnet, clinopyroxene, coazite specifically, um, and the total carbon in the fluid is fixed by equilibrium with diamond, for example, down here, then the FO2 is fixed by the ratio of carbonic acid, the long forgotten molecule, and this organic acid anion formate, given whatever pH of the system is required by the silicates. So this means that we can have FO2s in the upper mantle at values considerably below QFM that are fixed by the organic inorganic carbon speciation in the fluid plus the silicate uh, determined pH. Consequently, during diamond formation, we could write a reaction such as formate plus protons going to carbon in zero oxidation state carbon in diamond plus H2CO3 with carbon in plus four oxidation state and water. So this could be a pH change, for example, with no apparent change in the oxidation state of carbon, in fact, of oxygen. So in fact, O2, the redox parameter O2, um, log FO2 could be constant under these conditions because the amount of H2CO3 and formating the fluid is so high, that will be the buffer. And this can be expected to overwhelm the rocks that this fluid will pass through, which could well be the kind of explanation that has been alluded to by a recent remarkable paper by Kiseva and co-workers in 2018, showing that the majoritic garnet inclusions in diamond trend with increasing depth away from the highly reducing iron ferrous oxide buffer to back up towards more oxidizing conditions suggesting carbonate or carbon bearing species. So a fluid like this could do that, presumably. So I think that at FO2s of minus 2.7 below QFM, we could have fluids uh, roaming through the deep earth that have a very strong influence on the rocks that they pa pass through and on diamond formation and mantle metasomatism. So just to summarize, uh, we've calibrated the due model now with crucial subsolidus, high PT experimental data, particularly from the Kessel lab, but also with decades of previous experimental studies on mineral solubilities. The new complexes are metal complexes of various kinds that give very high solubilities in mantle fluids, but we also have a silica trimer, which is important. And we now have this forgotten carbonic acid molecule that I think in high pressure fluids is going to be a very important 
representative of the carbon family for influencing the evolution of mantle fluids and mantle metasomatism, and thereby even of the continents themselves. In summary, we've shown briefly that the dew model can go from watery fluids to magmatic fluids in the supersolvus region of pressure and temperature. And in principle, this opens up a new understanding of how fluids can control redox states, such as the FO2 in the mantle during diamond formation and mantle metasomatism. I'd like to just finally acknowledge all our colleagues in the Deep Carbon Observatory, and particularly at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Ronit Kessel's lab with Oded Navan, Oded Elazar, and Amit Melser for interaction about their experimental studies, which have been absolutely vital to calibration of the model that I presented. And finally, for this presentation to Katie Pratt and Josh Wood in the engaged team of the Deep Carbon Observatory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri. That was fascinating. Um, so we are going to go into a question and answer period now. So I just want to remind everyone who's watching the webinar that if you have any questions for Dimitri or for Mark, um, to please type them into the chat window um, in Zoom and um, I will ask them your questions. So um, Dimitri and Mark, I'd like to take a step back um, and just um, ask you to maybe talk about um, what inspired you to work together to unite the dew and the melt models in this synthesis project. Well, I, I really think that was Mark's idea. <laughs> uh, well, I can I can tell you what what happened. Actually, it, it's a it was it was kind of an interesting. Uh, um, series of events. I, I was at a Goldschmidt conference in uh, Prague, uh, listening to Dimitri give a, a keynote talk on, on do and the, the new ability to actually do the, these, these fascinating aqueous solution calculations at high temperatures and pressures. And um, I, I was sitting there realizing that I had been trying to add um, molecular fluids to the MELTS model in order to, to try to understand partitioning of, of water and carbon and, and other elements between an aqueous fluid or between a fluid and a, a silicate melt. And I was listening to Dimitri talk about do and realized that, that Dimitri has done all the work already, that, that do essentially um, was the fluid model that I was looking for. Um, and so, uh, uh, I began to, when Dimitri and I began to talk about this, and, and, um, and I realized that very, very quickly that, that not only had Dimitri done the work to develop uh, the DO model, but that the DO model was based on the same thermodynamic data that the MELTS model was based on. It, it, it came from the same sort of underlying data source. And of course, there had been independent development in MELTS and independent development in DO, but the important thing was that the, the basic thermodynamic database upon which uh, they both relied was the same. So uh, then it became just a matter of, uh, of trying to integrate the two. And, and that, of course, was, is, was a, a formidable task, but, mm. um, but the motivation, for doing that was, was this realization that um, do allows you to describe the, the properties of fluid in a much more uh, thermodynamically consistent way than trying to treat the fluid as a, as a molecular entity. And it, it's, that, it's that addition of the ions and, and this, this more robust description of the fluid that uh, really motivated the, the idea of combining the two. So having, I mean, ha having combined the two and having made these two models work together, uh, what are some of the things that are coming out of the project? What can you understand now that you couldn't before uniting the models? Well, I think that uh, what I've talked about today um, is a direct consequence of this project that I wouldn't have uh, discovered as rapidly without this project. I think the having the project funded by the Sloan Foundation really was a tremendous stimulus to to actually taking action on something that was an idea, but how would we really do it? And so I think for me the most exciting thing is that we were able to work on 
these carbon species, particularly CO2 and water at H2CO3, and to uh, discover really what we're discovering, is, I think, uh, I'll let Mark speak in a moment, but to me, it's so incredibly important to realize how, how, uh, how crucial a role carbon in fluids plays potentially in the upper mantle. Even though carbon is a trace species in most rock types in the upper mantle, it's just a trace species in the minerals. But uh, in terms of aqueous fluids, it really plays a huge role. And of course, in carbonatite melts uh, as well. So in terms of mobility of many chemical elements, carbon plays a crucial role in the upper mantle. And I think we knew about carbonatite melts from many people's research, but also in the Deep Carbon Observatory. But uh, the potential role of carbon in the fluids um, wasn't as widely appreciated, perhaps. Yes, and, and I, I think, I mean, in, in, in parallel to that, just sitting down, sitting down and, and trying to integrate the two models, you discover all sorts of things that you, you never thought to worry about before. I mean, one of the first things that, that we had to tackle in trying to combine the two models was, is there a description of the properties of water? and CO2 fluids that apply over the entire spectrum of temperature and pressure. And it turned out that, that there wasn't. That's something that we had to put together ourselves and, and, and get, get working. Um, then the first, uh, the first time I did, the first time we did the fully coupled model and began to look at the lower pressure regime, which, which, which Dimitri, which was represented by Dimitri as this region where you have a, a solace between the aqueous fluid and the magma, so that you have aqueous fluid coexisting with magma as two independent phases. When we began to look at that, we realized, or I realized, that uh, the, really the, the, the model for the magmatic system is woefully inadequate in trying to really understand the compositions of these fluids. And, 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 and but what I mean by that is that if you uh, calculate, for example, which we can do now, the composition of an aqueous fluid that coexists with a, a grunitic or a rhyolitic magma at low pressure, uh, you discover that the fluid is, um, is somewhat uninteresting in composition. Uh, and, and why is it uninteresting? Well, it, it's, it's not because in nature the fluids are uninteresting. It's because in terms of our modeling, we still do not have the ability to describe uh, fully the thermodynamics of, um, uh, of important components like the halogens in, in magmatic systems so that we cannot fully describe the partitioning of elements yet between the magma and the aqueous fluid at at low pressures, where carbon is less important in the fluid, but the halogens are more important. Mm. Yeah, chlorine. Yeah. yeah, so it's opened up all sorts of areas of, oh, I didn't know we needed to know that sort of research. And, um, and that's important. So now, now uh, to a certain extent, it, 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 it is motivating further experimental studies to try to flush out these, these sorts of issues. I've begun a program now of, of trying to calibrate the properties of chlorine in magmatic systems so that we can partition brines. Um, but there are issues like that that arise. And then, and then one subtle thing, which we, we haven't been able to explore yet, but I think is going to be particularly important, is that at a given oxidation state, uh, QFM or nickel-nickel oxide or whatever the oxidation state is, it turns out that the, 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 the redox state of the elements in the magmatic system is, is quite different than the redox state of the elements in coexisting aqueous fluid. So the act of partitioning between the magmatic system and the aqueous fluid involves a redox couple. And that's fascinating. Just, just, mm. just, just thinking about the fact that the mere partitioning of elements between a magma and coexisting aqueous fluid will change the redox state of the system is, um, is, is really quite interesting. And it opens up again, you know, as Dimitri has shown over and over again, you can form diamonds under all sorts of ways in the mantle. Well, you, 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 you can probably cause redox equilibria to take place 
um, simply by the partitioning of, of, of the, the fluid components from one phase to the next. And that again is something that um, we have not had time to, to, to flesh out and explore, but it has been instigated by this, this coupling of the model. I think it's really important uh, to couple models of various kinds if you can, because you always, um, as a consequence of that, uh, have, a, have a new appreciation of the richness of the chemistry that goes on when you do that. And, um, and that really, I think, is the, is the biggest thing that has emerged. The, the, the stuff that, that Dimitri talked about today is, is, is absolutely fascinating and cutting edge. And it is unfortunately an area where we have so little experimental data that it really is difficult to do the calibration, to do a sort of a generalized model. But um, but I think now that we're, we we have tools that can explore some of these 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 pressure temperature regimes where there are a few data, um, it will motivate more experimental work and and we'll be able to put that in a context with this with this modeling framework. So having united these two models, um, you've spoken about some of the research questions that were opened up. Did this also open up ways of bringing in other models? Have you tried to mesh these models with other models? Yes, so that's really a major development of this project has been its expansion massively into the Enki project right. that Mark leads. Uh, and I'm part of that and a number of other colleagues are involved. A very substantial project funded by NSF Computer Sciences. So Mark has been working recently with Mark Spiegelman on this very topic. So about chemistry and fluid flow. Right? And, and the, the, the Yankee project is, I mean, the, the broader context of the Yankee project is to develop a, a thermodynamic modeling environment that allows this, as Dimitri just said, coupling of the thermodynamic models with fluid dynamical models. Um, so because we have integrated melts and do, and because we've, as a, as a consequence of that integration, um, we've been able to focus on bringing in um, all of the underlying uh, the thermodynamic description of aqueous solutions and incorporated that into this, this, this broader Enki framework that includes models from Holland and Powell and from melts and from uh, deep, deep earth mineral equilibria from sticks root and, and so on and so forth. Um, because they are now all integrated in this Enki framework, it, 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 they are now available to use in the, in the context of the fluid dynamical modeling. And, and really the question then arises is how can we make um, that model coupling as efficient as possible? Um, so in the Yankee context, uh, what has developed from this is to, it, it's sort of curious, much of the Yankee project now has, has evolved into um, having computer code write computer code, which is very fast. Now that may sound ridiculous, but, but that is the, one of the major, uh, um, uh, one of the major things that has evolved out of the Yankee project is, is we now have the ability to specify models like dew and melts and, and mineral thermodynamics and, and, and do it in such a way that, that we allow the uh, specification of that model to be directly um, translated into very, very fast computer code. That can be uh, that can be compiled and then then essentially uh, incorporated or absorbed into other fast code that does the dynamical calculations. Um, and you you may think that oh well I mean why should a computer be able to write computer code faster than a human can write uh, not 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 write the code but why should a computer be able to make computer code that executes faster? then a human can write that computer code. And it's because when humans write computer code, they have to write it so that it's maintainable and readable by other humans and can be modified and so on and so forth. When a computer writes computer code, they can write computer code or it can write computer code that is unreadable by a human. But then when it's compiled, it can be made many, 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 many times faster 
than anything that is is more uh, manageable in terms of, of maintenance product. And um, the Anki project has has demonstrated that we can take uh, we can take the same models that have been computer coded or that have been coded by by humans. And we can allow the computer to generate that code and it's 100 times faster. Well, if it's 100 times faster, it means that we can, we can actually use very, very complicated thermodynamic models in a fluid dynamics kind of framework. And that opens up the complexity of the uh, property, material property relations that the fluid dynamicists can incorporate into um, the sorts of models that, that they're, they're, they're trying to use to describe real phenomena. And that just allows the chemistry to become much more relevant, much more um, realistic than it could be before. And so that, that's, a, that's one of these things that came out of the mm. um, Enki project that we never, when we wrote the proposals, we never anticipated this. When we, when we wrote the melts due proposal, it wasn't even on our mind that this would be one of the uh, significant innovations that arose out of, out of doing this kind of, of, of coupling. But, um, but but that's that's something that has that has arisen, and I think um, you know I think it will continue to be uh, now that we have this perspective. The the legacy of the the Melts Do project is going to be that that our 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 view of how to construct uh, thermodynamic models and particularly coupled models with dynamics has has changed completely now. Mm. That's a major advance, I think. I, I, I think it really, I think curiously enough, it is one of the, if, if not the central, but certainly one of the major advances of the Enki project. And it was not the intention of that project yeah. to begin with, which yeah. I, I, it's, just, it's serendipity. And, and that, that's what science is all about, right? That's why we do what we do. Right, right. Um, so just switching gear a little bit, um, in developing these models, you've also built user communities around the models. So I wanted to ask you um, how important the scientific community has really been in the process of creating and tailoring the models. Yeah, I have some experience with that, but you have to remember that I've only been doing this deep earth water modeling stuff since 2014, but through various workshops, uh, particularly, I think that's where the the most valuable interaction with people who tr who try to use what you have produced comes up, and then you learn all kinds of new things serendipitously, as Mark was describing. Yeah, I think that Mark has had a lot more experience with melts over decades, and uh, perhaps he can comment more on that. Well, I, so I, I've been doing uh, workshops involving melts for, uh, as Dimitri says, all, at least a decade, uh, if not a little bit more. And um, uh, that's always productive because you, 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 find, uh, you find new ways to use the software and modeling approaches depending upon the problems that people want to, want to solve. I think in, in the Yankee project, which we've been working on now for three years, there, we, we've had a number of workshops. And um, the workshops are, are very productive because again, they bring, in, um, they bring in users that have a diverse set of problems that, that they'd like to address. And, um, and you begin to focus then on developing the, the modeling infrastructure that, that is um, best able to address a, a wider spectrum of problems that any single individual can can talk about. I think the the workshop aspect of of any of this kind of modeling is really important. I think that's one of the things that um, that we need to somehow sustain. So mm -hmm. so as the melts do project has as is coming now to it to its close, uh, and as the anti project itself is coming to uh, a conclusion next year, um, we have to ask ourselves how we're going to continue to be able to drive the, um, the educational aspect and, and the informative aspect of the workshop experience to, uh, to, to keep people in, involved and engaged. Um, and I don't quite know how to do that yet. That's something that, that we're, we're all thinking about, but, um, but I think it's really, really important to, to continue doing that. 
Yeah, we actually have a question in the chat. Or, um, are there any melts do workshops planned this year? Uh, there are. Um, there's a there's a melts do workshop that is planned at the end of September, early October, in Toulouse. Um, it has not yet been um, formally announced, but but we have a date, and it's being organized by Isabel Danielle and uh, her colleagues um, in in France and Italy and, and Germany. It's intended for um, uh, largely for a European audience, but I think it's open for for anyone. Um, and we'll have um, more formal announcements of that as as the date gets closer. Um, but that is specifically that workshop is is, is aimed at um, Enki and and melts and do and the whole sort of um, integrated modeling experience. There will be um, a workshop at the Goldschmidt conference, uh, a pre-meeting workshop at the Goldschmidt conference in Barcelona. Uh, that is uh, uh, largely Enki related, less less do related, but Enki related, and it, it is aimed at um, uh, trying to uh, provide, uh, 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 trying to engage uh, researchers that are are focused on exoplanet research, uh, but in but in general want to to apply this this Enki kind of modeling environment to uh, larger problems that, that involve the coupling of, uh, of thermodynamics and, and, and fluid dynamics. Um, so there are those two workshops that are, that are on the books. There's, of course, the, the, the Enki user workshop, which is, uh, which is also going to take place this year in, in Colorado in, um, in August. If anybody is, is interested in that, they, can, they should contact me directly. Thank you. Well, we have run out of time. In fact, we've run over significantly. Uh, but this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Dimitri and Mark, for joining us. Um, I have put the link to the webinar archives in the chat window. Um, and we'll be posting an archive of this webinar in the next day or two. So if um, you have friends or colleagues you think would be interested in this webinar who may have missed joining us today, then please point them to the DCO website or YouTube channel to catch up. Um, this was the last in the current series of DCO webinar Wednesdays, but you can find more information about the other webinars in this series and watch the archives in the link I just shared. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at DeepCarb and check the DCO monthly newsletter for updates on any future webinars that we'll be running. As always, if you have feedback for us, you can drop us an email at engagement at deepcarbon.net. So thank you all for joining us for DCO Webinar Wednesdays. Thank you, Katie. Thank you.